this session is going to be recorded as well. Um, we will go through at the end and um, cut out faces so nobody will be on screen for anything. We put the slides over the top, so just if you're worried about that, um, we'll go ahead and, and clean up some of those pieces. But just so you know, today's session is being recorded. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I know we have some folks who are from uh, CU at Boulder and CSU who are with us today. My name is Bruce Mance. I'm an assistant dean in the graduate school. I'm also the director of the career development office. Um, we do a number of different workshops in the CBO. This is a workshop in the career skills series. So other workshops include career exploration and planning, CVs and resumes, informational interviewing, LinkedIn and networking. Um, one of the things we'll talk about when we get into the CV and resume aspect is that uh, none of these are meant to be consumed totally in a vacuum or in isolation. Each of these has um, parts of it that fit into a bigger piece. And so today we'll talk about CVs and resumes, but I'd encourage you to attend some of these other sessions as well. So as we start here, I want to figure out first who my audience is. So I'm going to launch a poll here. I want to know currently what are you thinking you want to do for your career? So we'll take about a minute. Um, so go ahead and just select kind of what you're, what you're currently interested in. And again, you'll understand why this is important when we get into more of the meat of differences between CVs and resumes. Okay, it looks like I'm, I'm mostly capturing kind of what people are thinking. Got about another 30 seconds to go ahead and, and weigh in with your responses. Okay. Five more, you, you got 10, okay. All right, so what are we looking at? So we have uh, most of you, the majority at least, are thinking about an industry position, industry scientist. Uh, second most is some kind of position in academia, tenure track faculty. Um, some other items on the list, uh, consultant people are thinking about, nobody interested in medical writing, okay, that's interesting. All right, so we have about in some ways, uh, maybe a little bit more preference for positions that are outside of academia. Um, but that's, that's good to know. Okay, thank you for, for sharing that. All right. So what are we gonna do? So knowing that some of you are interested in academic positions, some of you are interested in, in industry or non-academic positions, we're gonna talk about the big picture context here of, of what do you really need a CV and a resume for? Um, we're gonna go through some of the details about what CVs and resumes are, the differences between them, we're gonna spend some time learning how to identify different job skill categories and creating effective bullet points. Um, today's workshop is not designed in a way that at the end of it, you are gonna have a perfected document, whether that's a CV or a resume. Hopefully you will have ideas of the types of information that you wanna include on those, but I wanna uh, set expectations, right? That to get good documents, it takes time. It's an iterative process. You're gonna go through this. You're gonna to have to revise it. You're gonna to have to work at it. Um, and so just know that going in. So, so we'll discuss strategies and things to think about to include, but it is gonna take work on your part uh, to get this into good shape. All right, so question for you, and I'd like to just see answers in the chat. So when you think about a CV or a resume, why do you need it? Why do you wanna have either a CV or a resume? So just go ahead and type, type into the chat what you can think of <clears throat> for why you would need a CV or a resume. I'll read these as they come in. Scholarships, jobs, grants. Okay, Catherine, I think you, <laughs> you took everybody's answers. So what else, what, what else do people have? Opportunity to interview, yes. Showcase your training and your skill set. absolutely. So, uh, resume short skills, academic qualifications and applications. Uh, yeah, okay. Convey experience and skills. 
It was great. So, so right. So why do you need a CV or resume? The first one that often comes to mind is for job applications, right? It's a formal thing that you're submitting. You're submitting a resume for a position. You're submitting uh, the, your CV for that uh, academic position. Grants and fellowships. For NIH folks, right, you have a bio sketch. That's a different kind of version of a CV, but it's the same kind of thing. Um, you're applying for um, uh, scholarships or fellowships applications. This is a part of it. Award nominations, right? So you're going to have your somebody's putting you up to win some kind of research award or something else. Oftentimes, it's like, well, submit then also your your CV. A reminder of your efforts, right? So highlight your skills and accomplishments. This one, it's important for your own well-being to remember all the things that you have done. So again, having a comprehensive CV that you update on occasion. Uh, is an important thing just so that you remember all of the work that you do. Now, one of the things I want to highlight with this, and the reason that I asked this question to you, is that each of these has a unique purpose, right? So it's not the same. Oftentimes, and when, when we get into the CV, you'll see how this can be confusing, but I want you to start orienting yourself before you even start writing anything. Are you putting anything together? You're thinking about, why am I using this? Because the goal here could be different. If you're writing uh, something for an nomina uh, award nomination, you may want to highlight different things than when you're applying for that position. So all of this should start with the reason why you are using this document. Because the CV and the resume is just one piece of the puzzle, right? So today what we're doing is we're talking about this, this one uh, piece, but it fits into this broader picture. When you're applying for positions, when you're submitting a grant, when you're doing any of those things, the CV and the resume is not what you're going to be using in isolation. So it's going to be accompanied by a cover letter. This could be, you know, a formal cover letter for a, a position. It could be a research statement or a teaching statement. Uh, you're going to have letters of reference or recommendations that are going to accompany this, right? And so those things, there should be consistency there. This is part of, a, of the network that you have, right? This is how people get to know the kinds of things that you do. So when you're successful in applying for positions or getting grants or things like that, all of these things work together. And so again, one of the things that I, that I think um, oftentimes trainees, when they're thinking about transitioning, they go into this as the CV or the resume as being the, the holy grail. Like this is the thing, if I just have a really good resume or a really good CV, then I'll get the position. And the reality is that this is just one piece of it. And so I don't want you to put too much emphasis on this aspect of it. Um, it's always important to have this be a strong piece, but keep in mind that this is just one piece of this. If you have a strong network, if you have a good cover letter, if you have good references and people that can speak to your abilities, you can be successful with a decent CV or resume. If you have none of those other things, it really has to be exceptional uh, for you to be able to, to be successful in those cases. Uh, because in addition to looking at your accomplishments and looking at the things that you've done, if you're applying for an academic position, that department is also trying to figure out how you fit within their organization, okay? There are limited opportunities to bring in faculty. They wanna make sure that you're gonna be a safe bet. Are you gonna be successful? Will you get grants? Are you gonna do well in teaching? They also wanna know, are you gonna make this easier for your colleagues? Are you gonna teach, a, are you gonna teach stats? Because nobody wants to teach stats, so are you gonna come in and do it? Um, are you gonna be a good person to collaborate with? Do you provide new research techniques that other people could use in their own research projects? Um, what kind of service are you going to do? Do you want to start some things up? Are you going to move the department towards its goal, right? So a diversity statement is a pretty common thing now for academic applications. So, so how are you going to demonstrate your commitment to making uh, academia and that department a more inclusive space? What have you done in the past to do that? Um, do you want to start some kind of research center? Are you going to be the nexus of bringing together this disciplinary area? Uh, do you want to start a degree program, right? So they're looking at a lot more than just what's on your CV. They want to know how you're going to uh, affect other people in the department. When you're looking at an organization, a company's trying to do the same thing, right? They want to know if you're a safe, a safe bet because they want to decrease turnover. Hiring is expensive. It's difficult. It's time consuming. They don't want to have to go through this multiple times. So they really want to know, are you going to be committed to what it is that that organization does? Aside from that, though, they know that uh, you'll do better if you're connected to the company. So what kind of values do you have? What are you, what are you interested in doing, right? That is linked to productivity and engagement. If you believe in that company, um, that's going to increase output. It's going to benefit them in the end. 
So it's not just what you have done technically that they're interested in. They're interested in how you're going to fit in all of these other areas as well. And they want to learn how you operate, right? Because especially when we get into uh, non-academic positions, teamwork is a really big thing. So you're going to have to participate as a member of a team. You're going to have to lead a team potentially. And for all of these things, um, they want to see a little bit more than just your ability to, to run a Western blog, things like that, right? Um, again, you see this when you actually interview for positions where most of the questions you get asked are about uh, behavioral interview questions. So how do you manage conflict? How do you do those things? So I'm bringing all of this up again, because when we start to dive into the CV and the resume, this is th these are things you should think about as well. And how are you providing examples of this in the materials that you're putting together? Okay. Um, again, questions as we go through, feel free to just share those in the chat. So CVs and resumes, what are we talking about? Both for CVs and resumes. The goal here is to tell your professional story, right? Um, this, is, this is your brochure. This is the introduction to who you are as a scientist, as a scientific professional. Both of them need to present right away why you're the person for the job. Right? So oftentimes when we, and this happens oftentimes in scientific writing too, this is kind of how we're trained to it. You build up to the hypothesis. You build up to the punchline of the joke, right? You want to lead with the joke. You want to, you want to lead with that punchline. If you don't hook them right away about why you're the person to do that job, there's no guarantee they're going to read any further. If you save your most compelling arguments, your most important experience towards the end of your document, they may never get to it. Okay. Uh, the Army has a saying for grant writing, and I think it's important here. It's called bluff, and it's bottom line up front. And so you want to approach your documents in that way. What do they care about most, and why are you the person who can do that? Give them that information right away. As I mentioned, this isn't in isolation, right? So here's a chance for you to provide uh, specific examples of the statements you made in your cover letter, in your research statement, in your teaching statement. You're gonna talk about how you do all these things, how you're gonna move stuff forward. This is where you're giving those, those examples to support that. And again, when you approach this from this holistic lens, now there's this consistent picture of who you are gonna be as a member of that organization. So using those documents, right? And this is why having uh, a good idea of what the positions want and what they're looking for is important. Stating those things in your uh, other materials gives you some guidance as to how you assemble your CV or resume. They need to be pretty and professional, right? You, you want to pay some attention to that. You want to, again, you're putting this forward uh, as a representation of who you're going to be as, a, as an employee. If you are not paying attention to the details, if you have different sized fonts, if you have different style fonts, uh, if you don't have any white space, if you, if you have all those kinds of things, that's a sign potentially about how you're going to approach your work, right? So, so you want this to be a good representation. So spending some time on the aesthetics of it becomes important too. And one thing I always like to stress is that nobody that I have ever heard of has gotten a job based off their CV or their resume, right? You get an interview off of that. And so when you think about this, again, what you're trying to do is provide uh, at each step with each document a reason why somebody wants to learn more. So you're giving them information about things that you have done that uh, are going to help them in their situation, at their company, at their department to move things forward. And you want to make them want to learn more about it. Okay. So this becomes really important when we get to the resume, as you'll see, because unlike the CV, you don't have unlimited space to get that information in there. So what's a CV? Most people probably know this. Uh, it's Latin for course of one's life. This is all of your professional accomplishments since the time you were an undergrad. Okay, anything that you have done inside academia gets included on your CV. So education, academic employment, teaching, research, all of those kinds of things, right? How much you've done determines how long it is. So, so David Schwartz, who is the chair of the Department of Medicine at CU Anschutz, um, his CV is 65 pages long. <laughs> Right. So this is someone now, obviously, he has a very long career. He's somebody who's accomplished a lot for that, but there's no cap on it. Right. So keep that in mind. Right. That that the CV is just going to get longer, the longer you stay in academia, because you're just going to continue to add things to it. Uh, it doesn't really say what you can do. There are a lot of assumptions in here because what you're listing are those accomplishments. I got this grant. I published this paper. I taught this course. 
right? But you're not providing information about how you did that, how you diagnosed it, how you came up with those things. It's just the accomplishment, which again, when you're thinking about something that's gonna be 65 pages long, you don't have a lot of space to expand on each individual thing because people are just looking at the list, right? Nobody's gonna sit there and read a lot of in-depth information about every one of those accomplishments that you had. Um, you use CVs for academic applications. And this can be very confusing sometimes because when you look at positions that are non-academic positions, they'll say, send your CV or your resume. More often than not, I promise you, if you're not in academia, they do not wanna see your CV. They wanna see a resume, okay? The rule that I like to use for this when you're trying to figure it out is who's gonna be reviewing your application. If it's a faculty member, they wanna see a CV. If it is a hiring manager, an HR person in a company, they wanna see your resume, right? Because again, it's what is that person comfortable reading? Faculty, people in academia are very comfortable with CVs. They're, they can look at it and that's how they're making those assessments. Um, but outside of academia, it's more likely that someone really what they want is your resume. Now, the other tip that I would give is that if you have any doubt, find somebody at the company and ask them that question ahead of time. Not only will that give you more accurate information for you to use, you now have introduced your name as someone who's interested in that position. So again, these are ways to start increasing the likelihood that people will actually review your materials. So what goes on in the CV, right? Again, pretty standard. At CU Anschutz, we have the School of Medicine guide for formatting that goes through a lot of these different areas. At your institutions, at Boulder, at CSU, there may be those same kinds of um, uh, guides. I would look for those. But a little personal summary, this is really more about, it's not a summary of what you're interested in or what you wanna do. The personal summary is gonna be, I had this position at this place, I do this position right now, right? So I'm a postdoctoral fellow in this department, um, things like that. Contact information, this is usually pre uh, professional, not personal. So how would somebody mail something to you at your institution? What's your current institutional email address? Um, starting with education. CVs are very formulaic in a lot of ways, right? So it's education, research experience, grants. Uh, other things though, certifications, patents, teaching, service, um, poster presentations, right? Invited talks, separating those things out becomes important. So think about what's more prestigious. It's more prestigious to give an invited talk than it is to give a poster. So rather than just rolling all of those into the same section of presentations, separating out a section on invited talks versus poster presentations. Uh, CVs also, um, just general rule is that dates are on the left for CVs. With resumes, dates are on the right. These are just, again, little, little bits of information. So when you think about what do you include on your CV, look at this list and look at these other lists to see, do, am I capturing everything that I've really done? So how you present this, uh, it's just going to be a simple list, reverse chronological. So what have you done uh, most recently? You want to get that in front of people. Um, you're not going to put too much detail. In general, the content's going to remain the same. So you're going to have publications, that's going to get longer. You're going to have courses you taught, that's going to get longer. You're going to have uh, grants, that's just going to get longer. The one modification for a CV is that depending on the type of position, you may want to do some reorganization. And so what I mean by that is if you're looking for a research intensive tenure track position, what do they want to see first? They want to see your publications and they want to see your grants because that's what's most important. So those should be the first sections you lead with. Now, if you are applying for a position at say Regis University, right, where there's some research that's involved, but they don't expect you to get an R01, the vast majority of what you're going to be doing is teaching. If you lead with your you know, NIH funded grants and your strong publication record and those kinds of things, that's not putting what they care about first. They wanna see what is your teaching experience. Um, this is even true if you're looking at a place like CU Denver, which is more of the traditional 40% teaching, 40% research, 20% service uh, position. If you don't have strong evidence of teaching, if you haven't taught a lot of courses and you don't highlight that, it puts you in a different category. Because again, when they're looking for hiring, they have a need. And so you want to try to meet that. So with your CV, the one area that you might do some tweaking based on the application is just rearranging the order of what information you're presenting. You want to make this easy to find because again, it, 65 pages, 
I want to be able to see how many publications you have. So number those. I want to see how many grants you had. Number those, right? So that for the person that's reviewing this, when they're making their summaries, they don't have to count up how many publications you had. They can see, okay, so they had 20 publications. They have 15 grants, right? Like all of that stuff, the easier you can make it for the person reviewing your information, the more likely it is that you will get that information across to them. So one of the things that I like to stress here is that, uh, again, we're focused very much on the research and technical accomplishments, so grants you had, publications you have, presentations, things like that. But what's going to set you apart? Because everybody is going to have those things. So what are those other things that you have done? Have you been involved with a, a trainee run organization? Did you do some outreach event? Did you participate in some uh, professional society? What are those kinds of things that are adding to your story of what you do uh, and what you're really passionate about? So think about that going in, right? What are the kinds of things that are going to set you apart from everybody else that's applying for this position? This is true for the CV. This is true for the resume. Um, anybody who gets an interview is going to be technically capable of doing that job, okay? So who gets hired is going to come down to a lot of these intangibles, these other aspects. So I have, I have multiple examples of uh, former postdocs who were very involved with organizations, the Postdoc Association, um, or other things like that, where um, they were asked about that. We had this, this group on campus called Young Hands in Science that does K-12 outreach. Um, that was a big part of the job search process. Uh, in the interview process for them in their faculty positions, the people at those departments wanted to know about their involvement in those organizations. So think about this. What, what are you passionate about that sets you apart from your science? And think about those things and how do you showcase those as well? So we have a question about the School of Medicine guide. So that's so SOM guide, that's for the, the CU Anschutz School of Medicine. That resource is in the um, Google Drive under the, su the supporting resources stuff. So if you want to see more about that. And then how do you set yourself apart in a CV, right? So that's kind of what I was just saying. You're going to have research, you're going to have teaching, you're going to have those, but what are those other things that capture what you're passionate about, okay? And again, a lot of this is going to come down to not just the CV. So you're going to start establishing who you are and setting yourself apart in the cover letter, in your research statement, in your teaching statement. And the more you can align what you want to do with how that's going to fit within that department and move them forward, that's when people start to see those things. And again, when you have this listed here as, um, you know, uh, leader of Young Hands in Science, conducted 12 outreach events during this time, people are going to ask you that question. And so it's the interview when you have an opportunity to expand on those. Uh, include these other things that set us apart included as different sections. Yes, I would have these under different sections, right? So, so those kinds of things could fit under service or leadership. Um, it could fit with professional societies. Again, thinking about uh, holistically beyond your science, what are the kinds of things that you do, but set those apart and make it easy to read. All right. Okay. And we can get more to other questions you have about the CV uh, when we have the Q&A kind of at the end. So what's a resume? So the resume is not the same as a CV because it's not about you. <laughs> it's about them. In each of these situations, people are saying they have a problem, right? We need this faculty member to join our department because we're looking to expand in this research, right? But really, that's not a problem the department has because in academia, everybody is their own little company. There's, it's not really that you're all in it together, you're all moving things forward. That's much different than non-academic positions in industry where there's real teamwork, where the company is successful because they launched this product or they do this. Everybody's working together. And they're saying specifically, we don't have anybody that can solve this problem for us. We need somebody who can fix this problem. They don't care about you and what you've done. They care about them and what you can do for them. So orient yourself in that way when you're thinking about non-academic positions. Your resume wants to use action words and sentences. So, so what did you do and how did you move things forward, right? So um, you authored, you... Uh, uh, led a project you did right so like what were the things that you specifically did um, using action words and sentences to have an effective resume you need to provide explicit evidence and results so again to say that you're a great communicator or you have great communication skills okay why do I believe you 
if you tell me that uh, you know accomplished uh, accomplished scientific writer, um, first author published, you know X number of, of papers, um, you uh, authored this number of um, protocols or SOPs. If you contribute, like now you're giving me evidence of your communication abilities. You, you gave this invited talk and you won an award for it, right? Like you want to start providing evidence of how you can do those skills um, and then what happened because of it, right? So if you think about um, something like building collaborations, which we do in academia, if you built a collaboration that led to a grant proposal that got funded, that's a great example of how you could build partnerships, uh, conduct a project, and then you have this tangible outcome. So your resume, unlike the CV, there are space limits on it. So no more than two pages. And this is some people have said, you know, three pages, it, really it's gonna depend on the position and that you have an awful lot of stuff that's relevant for that position. Um, but then I also hear more frequently people like, well, I've heard it only should be one page. Uh, if you are um, at a graduate level scientific training um, with the accomplishments you have, certainly if you're a PhD student or a postdoc, um, the kinds of things that you have done will fill up more than a page. Two pages is, is a good benchmark for that. So I have here Harder Than Writing a Bull. Uh, and the reason that's on here is that there is a, a Luke Perry film. I'm really dating myself here. Uh, most people I'm sure don't even know who Luke Perry is. Um, but it was eight seconds because in bull riding, you had to stay on the, the bull for eight seconds, right? And there are estimates that people who um, uh, looking at your CV or resume are going to spend, I froze for a second. People uh, looking at your CV or resume are gonna spend somewhere between 10 and 30 seconds on it, okay? It's not gonna be an in-depth review. So you have to get this information in front of them right away. This is why having a network becomes so important. If you know people at that company that can, that can bypass some of those systems and get this to the right people who are gonna review it, that gives you an automatic advantage for that, okay? So uh, again, you have to be succinct in these two pages. You have to highlight what they're looking for. You have to hook them in early. Um, and then you wanna be able to utilize your networks in, in this process. So resumes are pretty much all non-academic applications. I have a but in here because there are uh, certain positions within academia that also might actually want a resume. Okay, again, if it's a faculty position, if it's a research-related position, it's you know 99% of the time going to be CV. If you're looking for academic administration, for example, um, or other positions, project management, things like that, uh, leading a core, being a grants manager. Things like that within academia, those potentially could um, ask for a resume. But if it's outside academia, again, the vast majority of the time, really what they want to see is, is your resume. So what goes on that, right? So contact information, but this doesn't need to be a physical address. Um, again, in this world now, nobody really cares where you live. Uh, better to put on there your LinkedIn profile, your email address, maybe a cell number, that kind of information. So Oftentimes you'll see a qualification summary profile start at the top of a resume. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, this is a nice introduction to orient everybody to all the things that are gonna come. So you, you provide this high level summary of who you are as a professional and as a scientist. Then you're gonna dive into that work experience, industry specific information, if you have certifications, things like that. Um, again, service leadership opportunities, honors, awards, Volunteer activities, um, you know, I, I would keep it professional, not necessarily just hobbies, unless they are things that are related to who you're saying you are as that professional. I have education on this list last, and I recommend adding your education last on your resume. So if you have a PhD, if you have a master's degree, that's going to come next to your name, right? So Bruce H. Mant, comma, PhD. People know that I have a PhD. Um, when I put education last, which often is this required component, people scan through your resume to find it. Uh, and so it's one way to get them to look at that document. The other thing is it's not really adding anything when you're outside of academia. It's, I have a PhD. They're not going to care as much that my PhD was from Harvard uh, or from CU Anschutz or from whatever, right? It's I, I have that degree. That becomes less important. This is different than the CV where oftentimes 
unfortunately, we still rely on pedigree. We look at where did you get your degree, in whose lab did you train, those kinds of things matter much more than they do for non-academic positions. So education is important, but you really want to launch into here are the skills that you have that will do this job for this company. Don't waste time on education at the top. Hook them in right away. So again, how do you present it? It's a list with bullet points. Um, here's where we dive more into how do you create those bullets. So the uh, NIH Office of Intramural Training and Education has an acronym that they recommend, which is treat each bullet point using PAR, problem, action, or accomplishment, and result. So uh, for all of you who are doing research right now, the, you have a problem that leads to you asking the research question. Nobody knows how to cure cancer. Okay, there's the problem. So you're looking at that by designing this set of um, experiments. Here are the things that you're doing to address that problem. And here are the results. You uh, wrote and received this grant. You published this paper. You gave this presentation. You found this exciting new discovery, right? So think about each one of your bullet points and try to apply that acronym whenever possible. Again, reverse chrono chronological. Here's where you're really going to provide that detail. And as I mentioned, specific examples of accomplishments and results. A resume has to be unique to be effective. It needs to be unique for each application. If you create one master resume and you just send that out for every position, you're not going to be hitting what that company is, is looking for. This is, again, where I mentioned this is difficult and it takes time to do. Um, but you want to spend time making sure that you are addressing what the job posting is saying they need. You want to create bullets that say, you're saying you need somebody who can build collaborations with key thought leaders. Here's evidence of times that I have engaged with key thought leaders and been successful. You want to make sure that you are tailoring it for each one of those applications. You only want to include what's needed. Again, you don't have to tell your entire history and story here. The goal is to get an interview where you can expand on this and add to the things you put into your resume. So the resume just needs to include what supports your ability to do the job, even if that means you're not including um, you know, something that you feel is really important. Like for example, you do not need to include all your publications and I would recommend that you do not <laughs> include your publications on your resume. You can say how many you have published, if there is one that is very pertinent for that position, you may highlight it, but you do not put the full bibliography of all of your publications on your resume. Okay, different types of resumes. So the classic one we think about is a chronological resume. So this is where you're just gonna put, I worked here, um, I did this at that position. Once you get into your career for a while, Sometimes, you know, I was a medical science liaison at Pfizer, and then I was an MSL at AstraZeneca, and then I was a, 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 an MSL at, at Teva Pharmaceuticals, right? So in that position, you're going to have done the same kinds of things. And so it doesn't really matter that you did these at Pfizer or AstraZeneca or Teva. It matters what you can do. And so a functional resume is just going to highlight those skills. Oftentimes, this is something that really um, people don't encounter this until they get further on into their careers. But then there's also this combination. So this is gonna be both chronological, but then broken out into functional areas. And so I'll highlight an example of this uh, a little bit later. And the right style is gonna depend on you and your experience level and what the position wants. Again, always start with whatever is gonna best demonstrate that you can do what that position is saying they need done. Um, that's, that's what you wanna do. So a little bit of stuff on layout. So Think about professional time uh, typeface. So just like in everything in, in life, don't ever use Comic Sans for anything. Um, having some kind of professional fonts, Calibri, Cambria, there is, I read something one time that Times New Roman is outdated for things. I think, again, the level of attention to detail that you place to this is an example of kind of who you uh, can be presenting yourself as as a professional. So Calibri is great but it's also the default font. Like I wouldn't, don't get really elaborate, um, but choose something that is easily legible. Margins, this is an important one for scientists because when you write that grant and you're allowed to have a half inch margin, you only keep half inch margins throughout your entire document. And then it's just this massive wall of text. Uh, that is gonna turn off anybody who's reviewing your 
materials. So uh, I recommend 0.75 uh, inches to an inch for margins on your document. You want to keep good white space. Again, make it easy for people to find the information they're looking for. Uh, using white paper, again, everything is electronic, so this really doesn't matter that much, but there are times when you may be able to give somebody a, a physical copy of that, um, and you can use nice paper in that situation, and it can make a difference. Again, this is probably not very important in today's application world, especially now. Um, don't include hyperlinks or graphics. Uh, this, again, can make it difficult when the person is opening it. You don't have control of that. If you're going to put in a URL, include the entire URL. Don't hyperlink it. This is a really important one, and I want to emphasize it. Um, use the language from the job posting. So if they're saying um, established, established relationships with key thought leaders, you want to say something in your document about key thought leaders. Because oftentimes what can happen, especially at bigger companies, is when you submit your application, the first thing to put eyes on it uh, is going to be a computer. They're going to run it through keyword scanning software where they're looking for the specific keywords that were in the job posting. So if you don't use those in your resume, even if you're saying you can do all those things, it may not make it past that first uh, artificial intelligence barrier. Okay, So use the job posting as your guide. Proofread it. Make sure, again, I mentioned before, um, there's not just spelling, but it's also grammar. It's ensuring that you have consistency in the fonts that you use, the same font size, all of those kinds of things. Because again, if you're saying that you're a really detail-oriented professional and you have all of these little inconsistencies and typos in your document, that's not making, that's not reinforcing what you're saying about yourself. So be consistent. All right. So what do employers really want to hear about? Again, what they're looking for are these skills. And so this is where we get really focused on the technical aspects and the scientific pieces, but there's a lot more to it. So there was a paper that came out in 2016 that looked at the labor and skills gap analysis in the biomedical research workforce. And these were the top skills that the companies were looking for. So project management, leadership development, uh, business acumen. So do you know about um, the financial aspects of companies? Communication is huge. Mentoring, right? Like academic culture, these are things that they care about. So these are the areas that people are looking for. You have done these things, right? So it's just figuring out how do you actually present those in a way um, and what is it that that company is saying that they want. There was a, another study uh, where they did a survey of recruiters and employers asking what do they really want from PhDs? And again, communication, problem solving, teamwork, leadership, teamwork, project management. So when you think about your CV, where's evidence of, of problem solving? <laughs> where's evidence of teamwork, right? Like this is where it becomes important to break down the things that are on your CV so that people have a clear picture and a clear understanding of how you do those things that go into the accomplishments that land on your CV, right? So again, it, it, thinking broadly about these skill areas and then capturing them on your resume becomes important, but it's not... It's not generic. You want to make this specific for the, the position. All right. So just a little summary. Again, difference between a CV and a resume. CV is not about, it's not about them. This is all about me, right? It's not you. It's me. This is just everything that I have done within an academic environment since the time of undergrad. This is different than the resume. The effective resume is saying, I hear you. You're telling me you have this problem. I'm telling you I can solve that problem. Okay, so it's just a shift in how you think about these materials. And this is really important more so for the resume than the CV. You don't have to become super egocentric and like, you know, think about the CV in that way. But the resume really does need to become, I'm listening to what this position is saying. So how, so how do we approach this? How do we do this? So this is where on the worksheet, um, this is one of the exercises that you can do after this session. So I'm just going to describe it and then we'll go through it a little bit. So one of the things to do is with the job posting you have, start off by categorizing the skill qualifications of those different responsibilities. Once you have a summary of really what that position is looking for, write a two to three sentence description of the candidate you think they're looking for, okay? So what do I mean by this? So here's a, here's a position that actually was uh, posted a, a little while back. Um, uh, Truximo was a company in Boulder. They're looking for a scientist. The description they had of the, of the person they were looking for, um, they were looking candidates with a strong science acumen, PhD in biology, um, 
five years wet lab experience, three years industry experience, all applicants will have immediate consideration. So when you see that, what do you think that they're looking, what, what, what would you stress in your resume? Anybody just quickly into the chat. What do you, what do you think you're gonna stress right there? Throw it out to the void. So what I would what I would think about is these are coming in. This is technical, right? Like I have to demonstrate my scientific expertise in molecular biology, biochemistry, or whatever it's going to be. Okay. When you actually get into the job posting, though, and you look at the responsibilities, and these are the actual responsibilities that are listed, um, and you go through these. So technical content authorship, I would categorize that as a communication skill. Conducting experiments in support of clinical investigation, I'd say that's a technical skill, maybe a management skill. Completing reports and other document, documentation, that's communication. Designing experiments geared towards uh, assays, that's technical. Communicate findings to non-technical audience, communication. Work with R&D folks, that's collaborations, that's communication. Uh, routinely generate written documents, that's communication. Um, reviewing, understanding, compliance, right? This is professionalism. This is rigor and responsibility. Safeguarding privacy data, that's rigor and responsibility. That's professionalism again. Processing and handling personal data, that's again, this, this professionalism and, and uh, research integrity kind of stuff. So when you actually look at the responsibilities, this position that seemed as if it was, we're looking for a technical scientist, 50% of those responsibilities are actually communication focused. So when you're putting together your resume, this position is looking for somebody who has a strong ability to communicate both in writing and through building collaborations with people. So that's one of those things that you would wanna stress. And again, you have to look at the job posting and break it down to see, you know, of all of those skills that they list, where do they really fit of the specific responsibilities? Where do they really fit in the kinds of skills that they're looking for? So you can use that information to then create a professional summary. Um, so if you go through this and you break down the job posting and you categorize those skills and then you write this description of what the person is looking for, this is a great starting point for your professional summary. So you can then add in things that are your passions and your values. If you can align this with what the company says they value, what their mission is, that's even better. Again, thinking about the fit. You wanna include those non-technical strengths, right? So, so what are the things that you do well in addition to your science? If you have taken the Strengths Finder personality assessment, this is a great place to start building in those talents um, to add in specific language for that. Um, so here's an example, and this is from a postdoc who was applying for a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship that he subsequently got. Um, this is his professional summary. So experienced biomedical scientist with passions for global health and disease prevention, consistently demonstrates strong leadership, effective communication with diverse audiences, proven talent at evaluating complex problems, developing firm action plans, simplifying solutions, and excited for new challenges away from the lab. This is at the top of that resume. So he has now oriented the reader into everything he is gonna present thereafter when you go through those specific skills. And the things that he, so he works at the State Department doing uh, uh, global health infectious disease. So he's stressing those kinds of things here because that's where he wanted to match. That's where he wanted to fit. So you can do that same thing with the job posting, right? So you look at the job posting, you look at the company, you're aligning those things. And again, now for the rest of your resume, you're gonna provide the evidence to support these statements. Okay, uh, question a list of categories you use for the job posting exercise. Um, so those are on the worksheet. All right, so again, you have a CV. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure everybody right now has a CV. So you're going through this process of turning your CV into this resume. You started with the job posting, you have this description. Now, how are you filling that in? So this is where you can take uh, items that are on your CV right now and break them down into the constituent parts to provide specific evidence of your ability to do these different skills. So the CV, again, it's just going to list things like your publications. It's not going to go through the process of how did you come up with that idea? How did you design the experiments? How did you troubleshoot or problem solve the presentations that came? And it goes on and on. And so this is the stuff that you want to take out of your CV and get into your resume. So you can turn these into these bullet points by breaking down those accomplishments. Um, and again, as you write those bullets, 
you want to make sure that you're providing examples to support that professional summary. So you have this summary. If I, t if I said I have great leadership abilities, I have to provide evidence of that. If I said I can communicate with diverse audiences, I need to provide evidence that I can do those things. So again, through the worksheet, this is one of those ways that you can, you can break it down. There's some examples in here. So uh, on my, when I was a postdoc, one of the things that we did was we created a mentor teaching program. And so that was listed on my uh, CV as mentor teaching program, right? Like program development, teaching experience, whatever it is. But when I actually look at that and I say, well, what did it take? And I think specifically, well, I had to establish some collaborations between the campuses. I had to develop the program and engage with faculty. I had to find money to support it, right? So you go through the process of writing out what did it take to actually accomplish that? And then you think about the results. So what are some of the things that happened because you did this? Did it save time? Did it save money? Did it earn money? Um, thinking broadly about that. And so one of the things that happened was that we actually identified lecturers for the department and we provided postdocs needed experience. So looking at that one item that's on my CV, when you start to dissect it and turn it into these, uh, the specifics of it, you now have the uh, foundations of what becomes an effective bullet point. So you can take that information and using the PAR acronym, you then quantify the impact. So what would go from my CV as being um, under teaching experience, you know, mentor teaching program, that would turn into program development, right? So I established partnerships with three faculty members uh, resulting in the development of the program. We found $4,000 from the psych department to run it. We effectively advertised the program leading to four times as many applications. Uh, the program resulted in multiple full course teaching opportunities for 25% of program participants. What I don't say in here is that was one person out of four, 25%, that's great. Um, but again, this is much more informative of my ability to build partnerships, right? So communication, collaborations, um, program management, all of those kinds of skills that companies are looking for. So you have information right now on your CV. Uh, it's just a matter of actually taking that information and breaking it out to provide evidence of the kinds of skills that people are saying they're looking for in those job postings. So what does this look like on an actual resume? So again, this is this postdoc that I was talking about. So in his professional summary, he talks about having strong leadership abilities and effective communication. This is also an example of what can be that, that tweener kind of uh, resume where you have chronological, but you're really binning these into functional areas within that chronological section. So he talked about leadership experiences, involvement with being part of the postdoc association, adding, uh, you know, so increased participation by greater than 200%. So tracking some of these metrics. Um, again, this is one of those things where right now, it's not just the things you do at the bench that matter, but the things that you do outside of the bench as well. Communication experience, um, talking about involvement both with scientific communications, um, other writing that he did. So contributing to a, a newsletter we have on campus, writing some op-ed pieces for that. Um, technical experience, it's in there because again, this is one of those things where it's established. He has a PhD in molecular vi virology. He did a postdoc uh, in infectious disease. So it's established that he's a scientific expert. That piece doesn't become as important as those, those other aspects to it. Um, so again, but talking broadly about the things that he accomplished. And this is all driving to support those kinds of things that he said in the professional summary. So then breaking it down to things he did as a PhD student, um, and finishing with the education. So going through all of these things to highlight what it is that he said he could do um, in his professional summary with examples that provide evidence and results of impact. Okay. So homework, right? Again, as I, as I tried to set this up, this is uh, a discussion about things that become important when you're creating a CV or resume. It starts with what's the position you're applying for? Why are you even putting this together? Why are you using it? Once you have that identified, then you can think about, okay, well, what's going to be most effective for me to use it in that way? After you've gone through the process, right? So here you got the job posting exercise. We have the CV to resume or uh, conversion exercises. There's a professional summary exercise in there too. If you want to go through that process to think about how do you build something that identifies your values, uh, your passions, the other things that you work towards. 
Um, once you have that finished product, there are a couple things you can do. And this is specifically for resumes, all right? So uh, one is just to compare your resume to the job posting using a word cloud. So you can just paste that content in. You should see the same words become big. If they talk about um, uh, assay development, that should come up big in both of those. Job scan is a site that's actually designed just to do this. You get to use it for a, a couple different times for free. Um, but they will actually take the job posting language and your resume and they'll compare them and tell, tell you what kind of match you have for how well you uh, match those criteria. Okay. So once you feel like you have a finished project, you can do some checking in that way. The other thing that becomes important is getting feedback from people in those disciplines, right? So this is why having that strong professional network becomes so important. This is why we stress doing informational interviews because informational interviewing is a way to start building relationships. Once you have those relationships established, going back to somebody later and saying, hey, it was really great talking to you a couple months ago. I appreciated all the advice you gave me. I'm getting ready to apply for these positions now. Would you give me some feedback on my resume? Okay, you can ask for that feedback at that time. Start talking to people uh, and getting that direct insider knowledge for it. Talk to your career center, okay? So at different institutions, there are different career centers that are available. I'm at Anschutz, I'm available to do CV and resume review. If you are applying for a position and you want feedback on your application materials, I'm happy to meet with you and, and talk about those things but get some feedback from people um, about whether you're actually making the case that you think you are. And then continue revising, right? And be gracious with yourself during the process. This is difficult, it's hard. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. It takes time uh, and intentionality. And so um, know that going in, that it's gonna be difficult, especially when you first start off doing this, um, but it will become easier over time. If you create a, a big master resume, that can be nice because then you have captured everything that's on your CV in these formats. And then what you can do is when you're applying for a specific position, you can just copy and paste the material that's relevant as evidence of your communication skills or your management skills, things like that. Okay. So we have a little over five minutes left. I want to address some, some questions that you may have. You can put those into the chat um, uh, and I will address them there. So one question, um, so soon a few papers in the process of being published, but not finished going through the review process. So we're going to suggest including them in CV. So this is, I'm, thank you for that question. That's a great question. Do you include on your CV, um, papers that are going to be submitted or are under review even, right? Um, that's a really good question. My recommendation is no. <laughs> and the reason I say that is that I don't see a scenario in which someone is reviewing your CV and they say, well, we weren't gonna offer them the job, but they have this paper that's under review. Uh, and so, you know, that's the thing that I think we should, we should now make them an offer for an interview because they had that one paper that's under review. I don't really see that happening. What I do see happening is somebody reviewing your application, seeing something you have listed under publications is under review and them saying, oh, this person is just trying to pad their stats. They're just trying to make their CV look more impressive than it is. So I think there's, there's more potential negative uh, consequence of including something that is under review, or it's certainly not something that is, that is about to be submitted, um, you know, or in preparation. Those I definitely wouldn't include, and I, I wouldn't include anything that's under review. That said, Include that information in your cover letter, in your research statement. This is a project that you have finished and you have just uh, submitted it for review. Get that information to them. Be ready to talk about that in other places. Put that information out there, but don't include it under your publications on your CV. Um, so a question about would T32 positions belong under awards or experience research positions on a CV? So it could be in a, a couple different places. So I think that having a, a T32 position, um, especially if it is a competitive process that you had to apply for it to get it, um, including that under a uh, honors section or an awards section, um, it makes sense because it's a competitive process and you were awarded that. It's not gonna be under grant funding in which you were the independent PI, although you potentially could put it uh, under there as well. Again, I think 
when you think about these, um, you could highlight that on your CV in your education position. So if you're a postdoc on a T32, um, you can have that as, you know, T32 supported postdoc in the department of whatever under your current position as a postdoc. Because again, that information is getting out there right away. And so as you think about these things, the goal again is to try to get what the reader is going to find important and valuable to them right away. Okay. Um, if there are other questions, I'm happy to take other questions. You can, you can add those in the chat for anyone else. Um, if you are, uh, if you had enough for today and, and you're ready to, to take off, that's fine. I, I would ask please again, to complete the evaluation. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, I'm also happy to take uh, any of those by email if, if you want to shoot me an email for that. Um, but I'm also happy to, to stay on it if we have some other questions. So it looks like we got another question. Um, uh, uh, syntax and the use of I in describing accomplishments. So general rule is that, especially on a resume, you do not ne ever need to say I, my, anything like that. It's implied, you're including it because you did it, right? So you don't need to say, I led a team of 15 people. You say, you know, led a team, communicated. That, so again, um, having more of a um, direct presentation of the accomplishment and you don't need to state that I did it. The one, the one place where you might have, um, and this is your voice, this is your personality. The one place where you might have uh, some use of that would be in the professional summary. So I, you know, I'm, I, I am passionate about blah, blah, blah. That, that could be okay, um, but I think you also don't even need to use it there. I think it's just as fine if you say passionate about, you know, you, this is your resume, right? So anything that is on there is gonna be related to, to you. The other thing I will say is that at the end of the day, what is important is that you're getting your message across. So getting people to read that material, not making it too wordy, um, that becomes an important thing. There's a brevity piece that is, that is important for this. Okay, uh, question, what would you recommend for a timeline for informational interviews and to reaching out again for resume feedback? So what I recommend is that uh, informational interviewing should be something you start doing early and continue doing throughout. So as soon as you're interested in some kind of position, you should start talking to people that are doing that. Um, if you approach people for an informational interview, what you're saying is, I think what you do is really cool. Would you give me some advice and tell me more about it? That's not really asking them for much. That's how you can start laying the foundation for uh, some relationships. And if you have a good conversation with somebody and if they gave you really helpful advice, then going back to them later and saying, you know, this is really great, I appreciate it. That's not, that's not a big ask. And oftentimes they're willing to do that. Sometimes they'll even offer that up at the end of the informational interview, right? Um, I have lots of examples of people who through the informational interview process, somebody said, hey, I'm interested in this position. Uh, I'm, would you give me some feedback on my resume? And they say, well, yeah, yeah, send it to me too. I'll, I'll get it to the hiring manager for you. So there are other little things that can happen from that. For the timeline, it's just gonna depend on how strong of a relationship you feel you had or how good of an interaction you had with that person. I would, I mean, it, it could be that by the end of that conversation in the same time, if you say, you know, I'm looking at these positions right now, I don't really know, I had questions about my resume too. It could be within that same conversation that they say, well, I'd be happy to give you some feedback. I would say it, it's just gonna depend on how you feel that interaction goes. I don't know that there's a real formula of you need to wait at least two weeks or anything like that. It's more about, I feel like I, I had a good conversation with someone who was willing to give me some advice. And that could be as soon as you've done it, it could be after. And, but again, the point being, it, the sooner you start doing informational interviews, the more opportunity you have to establish that network of people who can give you that feedback. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Uh, if not, I thank you all for attending. I hope you found, uh, I hope you found the, the workshop helpful. If you have questions, I'm happy to address them later. Once we have the recording 
um, packaged in things, we will send it out in a follow-up email. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope I hope you found this helpful and that you have success with your application materials. We will uh, see you all at future workshops.